Hi, this is your Sapin Party and welcome to another episode of TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us once again Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of Reckon. And today we are going to talk about a uh, latest, you know, uh, announcement by Red Hat. A lot of uh, discussions are going on, a lot of heated debates, a lot of unnecessary hype. But then there is also reality. So uh, first of all, Rob, tell us uh, what is actually going on there. <laughs> Boy, I've read so many different summaries summaries of what has happened. Um, the, without going into too much of the history of how things go, um, Red Hat, which is the by far dominant enterprise Linux distribution, something called Red Hat Enterprise Linux or RHEL, uh, has the Red Hat has um, been uh, allowing in the community a version of its enterprise Linux distribution that is free and open. Um, so you don't have to pay to get what had been uh, since for the last year, the, the most recent version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux was available for people to update and download in, as a product called CentOS. Um, and, and that, when, when they made that change, it was called CentOS Streams, caused a bit of consternation uh, because a lot of companies depend on that free open version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux to test, modify, um, run, in a lot of cases, their infrastructure. So they, they depend on the fact that it's, it's a um, exact, what people call a bug for bug copy of this Enterprise Linux. Uh, at, but then they don't have to have the subscription. Uh, it's actually a very expensive uh, license subscription to get that enterprise Linux. So it's created a huge ecosystem around it to have access to that, that CentOS system. But what Red Hat had done last year was they had said, you know what, we're not going to keep making all the old versions available. We're only going to allow you to have um, what, what I would call the tip version, the very latest version of that code. So if you want, you know, a, a one-year-old version of CentOS or uh, a Red Hat, you know, access to the uh, free open Red Hat, you can't do it anymore. We're not going to make those available. The industry responded very uh, vigorously, and people created um, CentOS copies that reflected other versions. So as a consequence of Red Hat saying you can only have the tip, uh, multiple companies, uh, the two most notable are Rocky, uh, three, Rocky, Alma, and Oracle all started maintaining versions um, that had back revs of that, that distro. So if you wanted an older version, you could go to one of their distributions and get that license uh, or get that code. Um, the, the change that Red Hat made uh, last week was they stopped publishing all of that source code for CentOS. So while they'd only built the very latest, the, the tip or the stream version, they were calling it, they, you could still go and see the older versions. So if Red Hat 8 had a patch to it, you could see how they patched it, and then you could build a Rocky 8 or an Alma 8 or an Oracle 8 um, distribution that would match Red Hat 8. Last week, that changed. Last week, they stopped making all of those changes to anything but that very tip, that stream version available, which meant that in all the other distros, you wouldn't get bug for bug changes to previous releases of Red Hat. Um, which people might say, I don't care about all that. I just need the latest, but that's not how enterprise works. Nobody releases the very latest code. They, they all have some historical version of the software. And so what's happened with this change is we no longer have the guarantee, and the drift will happen actually pretty fast, that these other distributions are exactly the same as Red Hat. So if you are relying on um, Red Hat 8.1 or even older 7.5, and there's a bug found in that that they fix, that Red Hat fixes in 7.5, the other distributions actually don't know how that bug was fixed. And it could cause behavioral changes in those other distros. It'll never show up in CentOS Stream. CentOS Stream might fix the bug, but it might fix it differently than older versions. And 
that means that all of these other distros, now if they go fix that bug in their previous releases, one, they have to do it, which they didn't have to do before. And now there's going to be drift between the standard, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux standard, and all of these others. And so that drift is going to magnify over time. And for customers running data centers, depending on, you know, that the confidence of that, that, that whole ecosystem now is um, it's drifting. So you, you, you can't count on the compatibility between the, the enterprise Linux, Red Hat enterprise Linux version and anything else. Perfect. Uh, thanks for explaining that. Now, I also want to understand if you look at the modern world, most of folks are like, hey, we run everything on the cloud. So I also want to understand what is the importance, significance of something like CentOS in today's world, or for example, RHEL, uh, so that we do understand why folks are worried about these changes. It's a, it's a really significant question. And, and the number of uh, Red Hat like, which, which for me is going to come back to how the packages are distributed, RPMs versus like Debian is going to use Debs. Um, these these Linux distributions, most people don't manage their own OS. Now the cloud providers do, and they will they they want to be compatible with these with all these sources. Um, these other distributions do, but the the ultimate thing that people are packaging here are the RPMs, the packages that go into that Linux. And this is really where people get up in arms and where the concerns is. If you are building a package, an RPM, for a distro, and because Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the dominant one, you, you would target that release and then get the benefit of all these other OSs. They could be versions that they have in the cloud, like Amazon Linux, Microsoft uh, is working as Mariner, um, there's their Oracle has their own, right? There's a whole bunch of different distributions here that are part of how these ecosystems go. And um, the, the challenge becomes if we start having drift in the operating systems, then when you build your RPMs as a target for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.5, if there's drift, that RPM might not work in any other distribution. Or if you go and use Rocky 7.5 as your source and test against Rocky 7.5, and you're like, this is great, I got my RPM, I'm ready to go to market. And you show up at your enterprise, Red Hat Enterprise Linux customers, you might find that that RPM doesn't work because they're not binary compatible anymore. They have behaviors that you didn't expect. And so what, what, what has people alarmed here is the idea um, not so much that Red Hat is acting commercially, right, and protecting their interests, but that now if I'm going to build any packaging for Linux, I actually now have to account for the variances across the different Linux distributions in a, in a much more granular way. And we already had that with Debian and the Debian Linuxes, right? It was harder to produce packages that worked across all the Debian flavors of Linux. Um, but now with this change, I might now have to be asking people, which version of you know, RPM packaging are you using? Because I have to package you know, my Rocky and my Alma Linux and differently than my Amazon Linux differently. And, and that, that drift can be very expensive for the software ecosystem to manage. Um, and there's an asterisk with this. We've been putting things in containers a lot more lately. Containers you know, really depend on the kernel. This is not likely to impact the kernel as much. And so you know, if there, it, it might have the effect of pushing the industry even more aggressively towards um, distribution agnostic um, distribution agnostic distribution, ways to get your code into the market that don't rely on a distribution. Um, and so containers, uh, things like Go that don't, don't care about the, the, the flavor of Linux particularly much, um, those might become even more important from a, a packaging perspective than they had been in the past. Perfect. Uh, since you brought this point, I also want to talk about when you look at uh, Linux uh, market, if you look at just not the if you go to DistroWatch, there are at least a million distributions there. But if you look at the enterprise, we look at, you know, Sleet, Suze Linux is there. Of course, Canonical, Subuntu is there. Uh, Debian is there. And RHEL is there. Oracle Linux is also there. 
But once again, the point comes back to we are not even looking at Arch and Gentoo's and uh, Kubuntu's and Ubuntu's and all those things. But the thing is that uh, a LAMP stack doesn't mean that it will just work across all the distribution. Once you pick a distribution, you kind of get logged into that vendor as well. You get logged into that ecosystem, which kind of is not just because Linux doesn't mean you will just move around very easily. And as you're talking about, folks will start to look at uh, uh, something which is distribution or agnostic. Uh, I'm kind of curious why it has happened so far because it kind of is pain to move from SUSE to Red Hat to Canonical Ubuntu to Debian. Uh, what kind of what kind of uh, uh, development you think you will see in this space? And uh, do you feel that hey maybe this is the right move to push people in that direction, uh, or you're like you know what that was never a big problem. Um. Boy, I you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux for our enterprise customers and RackN definitely interacts with the largest banks, uh, service providers, um, uh, gaming company. Right? We we are across the board, and Red Hat Linux dominates the market for Linux because you have the support, you have the reliability, but also because it's had this big ecosystem where. The vendors of the you know of uh, the the customers the vendors serving my customers know that they, if they build it for say CentOS then they get the benefit of that bigger market, um, and I do think it's going to cause I know it definitely caused RackN to step back and think through how we support um, those types of Linux flavors and, and those types of Linux variances. Um, I think it's going to cause a lot of teams, um, uh, in some ways, to, to tie in deeper to their vendors. It's going to cause us to build more walled gardens because the portability between vendors has is, is disappeared a bit. Um, but I already see this as a challenge. Machine learning has a lot of Ubuntu um, or Debian-based work. And you know that thing surfaced there first, and I already hear from our customers that they are struggling to get that new machine learning pieces into the corporate standard because the Red Hat family does not move as quickly. By design, it doesn't move as quickly. And so, you know, what we what we're doing here is we're actually making it harder for people who want to move quickly to target a Red Hat style distribution than people who want to move um, that you're right that that's the challenge and so there's a lot of innovation happening here that I think you know will push people into the Debian releases and the Debian process it also opens up the possibility that one of these other uh, red hat you know what had been a CentOS uh, derivative to step forward and become more of the the dominant one in this case, I think that's a much harder thing to do. I think they're going to be fighting Red Hat, you know, every every step of the way, and Red Hat's going to come in and defend their turf very aggressively. Um, it will, like I said, I think push more people to give up on you know packaging except in containers because they don't want to. They they really don't want to have that that uh, uh, battle. But and this is a critical. Most companies could run other Linuxes, but don't. And there isn't a lot of incentive for an enterprise that has a relationship with Red Hat to maintain multiple Linux relationships. Um, this might be opening up the door for that to happen and for a company to say, you know what, I, 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 I want a, you know, another distro um, and I'll, I'll look at that. I, I haven't seen this have as much hand-wringing for the enterprise customer as it does for the rest of the industry um, that that is trying to be part of this ecosystem. Um, and uh, and that's, that's sort of the observation I have today. I, I had the same observation about VMware a year ago, and it took a year, and then all of a sudden enterprises started waking up and being being very concerned about it. So there hasn't been a triggering event yet that causes uh, an enterprise to really feel threatened by this move. But we haven't had time for software to only be available in Rocky or only in Alma or only in Oracle Linux in a way that says, I can't support you if you're on Red Hat. Um, 
enterprise customers are not used to hearing that phrase. Um, and this change for the first time in, boy, my industrial, my, my experience in the industry, we might be entering a place where people say, if you're using Red Hat Enterprise Linux, that you, you can't get support for software on it um, because it's not as open or it's not as available as these other distros. Assuming they can figure out how to create a shared repo where Alma, Rocky, Oracle, you know, and all these other Linuxes, if they if they can figure out how to be bug for bug compatible between each other, then people will move to the multi-vendor version, and we, you know, that that will be a seismic shake when people start saying, I can't support you on Red Hat, but I could support you on something else. That that conversation has not been, that, that phrase has not been widely heard. It's usually been the other direction. With this change, Red and if the industry can respond, Red Hat might open them up to having the experience that SUSE and Canonical have in market. Um, and I, I'll tell you, it's, you know, that's, that's not a bad thing necessarily. I don't want to have to support tons of different Linux distributions, but I sort of already do. And so that's, that's baked in, um, you know, having a little bit more multi-vendor choice and variety in here is, um, potentially good for the market. What does it mean for REC? And, and of course, I talked to Rocky Linux uh, yesterday. And I mean, of course, there are a couple of options that they have so that the users, because next year, I think CentOS is reaching end of life, the, the last CentOS. So that will going to be a big challenge. What does it mean for REC? And are you worried or you feel that these communities, as you mentioned, they, they, they are in a good hands? Uh, we're still trying to parse through for for us what it what it means. Um, last year, when when Red when CentOS changed the CentOS streams, we um, migrated away from CentOS as the basis for our discovery image, which is now based on Alma Linux. Um, we don't modify that, but we do we do package it, um, and so it became necessary for us to migrate. We just for for what it's worth, we produce at least four distinctive versions of our discovery image for exactly the reasons I'm talking about. Different distributions have different needs. We have one that's based on Debian for image-based deployments because the tools there favor image, you know, Debian packaging. Um, and so, you know, we already sort of bake this into our processes and, and what we have to support. It adds some expense for us, but it also, you know, mirrors what our customers ask us to do. Um, and we already have to support, you know, flavors of Linux like crazy. So, you know, every flavor of Linux that we support has its own boot environment and its own deployment process. And th that type of variation is baked into our system. Um, very pragmatically, it's better for our business to have more variation because we abstract that business and help customers cope with it. So from a rack end perspective, you know, bring on the distros. It's, it's a little bit more work for us to support, but it's highly valuable work for us to provide abstraction layers for our customers so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time somebody says, I can't use all my, I have to use Rocky. Um, Right, that's a very pragmatic benefit to us of having something that abstracts, just like we abstract out Dell, HP, Lenovo, Supermicro, Cisco, right, Raspberry Pis, mainframes, and everything else, and the clouds. Um, you know, the more variation in the market, the the more you need support in addressing that. The harder it is for you to lock in and have one choice. And I think from from a customer perspective, the tr ability to go at your own yourself um, and have just one thing keeps getting harder. That that keeps going down. But. The benefit on the other side is that as you get better at supporting multiple things, your supply chain neutrality, your ability to absorb shocks and supply chain and changes goes way, way up. And so, right, I think ultimately there is some, some hardship that customers will feel and adapting to that hardship puts them in a much better commercial position anyway. So it's sort of like taking your vitamins. 
you're going you're gonna to have to do work to accommodate these changes. But if you had been doing that work all along, you would shrug off the changes. Um, and that's, that's sort of this, this net in how the market should work. Um, you know, this is very core to Racken's mission and philosophy. We don't believe that the market is served by having, you know, big megalithic vendors that customers who have, you know, distributed supply chains have choices in how they operate ultimately are better positioned to own their own infrastructure, have control of their destiny, have leverage in, in those relationships. Uh, and so from that perspective, you know, things that sort of expose market dominance and a single market player who's trying to exert their, their influence, when those backfire, like this may, um, those actually result in a healthier market, a healthier ecosystem for everybody. Um, and, and so I, I think that, you know, it's worth discussing, it's worth understanding how these things go. And it definitely, definitely, uh, companies should be discussing this and preparing for it. But just like VMware exposing, you know, the acquisition of VMware exposing people to the idea that they, they maybe were over indexed on a single hypervisor. Um, I think there's, there's potential upside for the industry after a couple of years. I was talking to founder of Rocket Linux and they were like, you know, in Jurassic Park, they were saying, you know, life fi always finds a way. So same thing with the open source is that open source always finds a solution. Uh, so yes, we, as we're talking to them and we talk to you that there are options. I also want to understand as these alternatives do emerge, a lot of enterprise customers, yes, they do love the idea of things are open source. We discussed earlier also, but they also want a throat to choke a commercial vendor because they may not have all the resources or they don't want to waste their resources in plumbing things. So also talk about the commercial aspect behind these alternatives. So I, I, I love the way you're phrasing this and, and, and bringing up the magic with open source is when it's a collaborative environment. Right. The, the thing that I, I hope to see is not that Rocky Linux or Alma Linux becomes a replacement for Red Hat, but that they actually do what open source communities do, which is collaborate on a shared good, build an ecosystem. Um, and and that's that is when when that happens in open source, it is magical because it creates collaboration. It creates a place where where there is a, a, a mutual benefit and an ecosystem gets created. And then I also agree with you very strongly, enterprises don't have the expertise, the bandwidth, the time of of main, of, of doing that collaboration themselves, right? It, it doesn't work when it's a million people collaborating or a thousand people collaborating. It works when there's tens of tens of people who are really at the core of governance, right? Some people would say there can only be one, but at, at the end of the day, you need you know, a, a, a core cadre of people who really understand what's going on to, to collaborate and run it. And then a pyramid effect of downstream people who benefit from that and pay into the ecosystem. And so it would be very exciting for me to see a uh, companies that actually can shop for the, the commercial distribution, the support they want, that they can put their, their licensing and, and, and monetary dollars behind you know, some of these distribution companies that then would still collaborate around the, the, how the distribution works um, across multiple vendors. Um, that would be an amazing change in, in the market. It, it would create long lasting benefits here um, for that type of work. If the commercial aspects were driving us to collaborate around an enterprise distribution of Linux, um, we, we could spend another hour talking about why that's hard um, and what commercial support and what support actually looks like and, and why it's so, such a challenge to um, maintain a distribution in production. Um, and, and hat tip to Red Hat for having done that work for so long. Um, it's, it is hard work. It is expensive work. Um, and, you know, I would love to see us be um, even more open in how that, that work gets done. So, um, opportunities here definitely, uh, and it's fun. It is fun, especially as somebody who is is not trying to be the one uh, fighting for what that new distribution should look like. I'm I'm more of an observer here, with you know dealing with the consequences of those decisions. Um, it is really remarkable to watch an uh, the community come together and rally around around what what they want to happen. 
and we'll watch how that goes. Rob, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this very sensitive, very controversial topic. But uh, I'm actually happy that we look at the positive side of it, the solution side of it, and what is happening. So thanks for all those insights, and I would love to chat with you again. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. 